Hey everyone, welcome to episode 20 of the Serra's Podcast. If you're still with us, I thank you very much. And if you're new to the Serra's Podcast, we hope you enjoy listening to them as much as I enjoy making them. In my opinion, the first 20 episodes have been really good, but I feel like they've also gotten better as we've gone along. Not only in the quality of the audio, but also the content. I feel like we're always on a learning curve, but they'll always get better, I hope. We have some great people lined up, so be sure to stay tuned. Also, be sure to subscribe where you listen to the podcast. Some people have mentioned that they don't get the updates, so be sure to hit subscribe where you see it. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and even on desktop at www.serraspodcast.com. On to today's podcast. Andy Haler is a really interesting chap. He is, from what I know, the only person in the world to eat at every three-star Michelin restaurant in the world. And, as an independent reviewer, he writes about them on his website, www.andyhaler.com. The link will be in the show notes, where you will find thousands of reviews of the best restaurants in the world, London and all over the UK when on his travels. We discuss the review process, the Michelin guide, and food around the world, and his favourite restaurants. I hope you all enjoy And be sure to retweet, share or comment. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So hit us up at any time. Andy Haler, thank you very much for your time today. Nice to be with you, Sally. Um, So, give us a little bit of info about what it is that you do, for anybody that doesn't know. Okay, so I write about restaurants, um, and uh, essentially uh, my speciality is um, sort of high-end restaurants, in particular those with three Michelin stars. Um, So, um, but I also write about you know London restaurants in general. And how long have you been doing that now? I've been writing professionally um, since 1990, so it's quite a long time now. Um, yeah. sort of, um, so pre-websites, really? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, then I, well, I sort of, we can talk about this, but uh, um, I, I started doing that for a UK publication. Um, and then a few years later, I, I, I developed a sort of newsletter about restaurants just for friends. And then um, somebody suggested to try and get it published. So <clears throat> that led to um, a book um, that was published in 1994, 95, um, called the, just, it's, it's out of print now, but the, uh, the London Transport Restaurant Guide. And that was just my sort of, you know, guide to, to London restaurants. And I, I put the uh, uh, website together at the same time because I knew it was going to be a, a one-off book and obviously the content would get outdated um, and I used to work in technology um, so it wasn't such a big deal for me to to do that um, though at the time I guess it was relatively early in the days of the mm. of the web um, so you know I think if you go back and look around the sort of history of the internet um, as far as I know um, andyhaler.com which is the site um, is the oldest running sort of restaurant related website in the world as far as I could find out. I dug around and I, the oldest I could find was 1999 so I, I could be wrong about that but I'm, as far as I know there's no other uh, website has been running for that length of time. I may be misremembering but last night when I was on your website I think it said there was over 800 reviews. Um, that would just be London actually. Oh, okay. um, it'd be 900. In fact in London there's um, eight, eight, over 1,800 wow. different reviews of which about half are in London um, and the rest are around the world. Wow, that's some dedication there. Yeah, and in fact, that's, that's actually, there are actually more than that, in fact, because that's the number of restaurants reviewed, and in some cases, certain restaurants have been back to several times, and there'll be multiple reviews. So if you look at something like the, the Ritz, there's probably you know, at least 10 reviews of that one. Um, I mean, some places only go to once, but yeah, so it's actually more than that. I'm not, not quite sure what the total number is, but the, I know in terms of restaurants, it's uh, just over 1,800. So what leads somebody to say, you know what? I want to be a food reviewer. You weren't involved with food. No, I worked in technology. Um, so I used to work for <clears throat> in the oil industry, but, but always as a um, as a technologist. Um, and I 
was working for Shell, um, and I was travelling quite a lot um, at some point, particularly in the 1990s. Um, and um, one of the peculiarities of the uh, of the Shell expenses system was that um, you uh, used to just get an allowance per day um, based on where you were going, rather than having to you know collect receipts and fill in the expenses forms. So it was quite a quite a clever idea. Um, and because of that, a lot some you know you could choose. Some people would just stay in a cheap hotel and eat at McDonald's um, and I tended to do the opposite and, and basically go to the best restaurants you know in, in the whichever city it was I was I was visiting so that sort of got me you know interested in in sort of you know traveling around and eating in, in restaurants um, but I suppose the, the thing that really sort of changed my sort of perception of high-end food was one particular meal um, in 1996 uh, which was when I went to um, uh, Jaman in Paris and Jaman is no longer around but it was the sort of the restaurant of Joel Robichon mm -hmm. um, who sadly sort of died about a year ago but he was generally regarded as the sort of the best chef in the world and uh, I went to um, to his his restaurant when he was pretty much at the sort of height of his powers, and um, it was you know, very you know made a big impression on me. Um, and I started sort of to go well for a start. I went back there sort of at least twice a year until it closed. Um, but it really sort of got me interested in in trying to discover other really sort of high end dining experiences because the you know the food there was clearly a lot better than anything I'd eaten in the UK, and maybe realised that maybe there were you know other places like that and uh, so I started to sort of you know have little little trips and holidays you know sort of based around sort of trying sort of famous restaurants and like in the 1990s in France like was it quite snooty was it quite posh or um not necessarily um I think it varies a lot by the individual restaurant I think the difference was that the in many cases the the restaurant's did quite a heavy style of food mm -hmm. so there was lots of sort of you know big um sort of, you know, creamy sauces and lots of sort of you know reductions and um so it was quite you know you if you had several meals you know in the same trip you know it was quite so sort of hard going after a little <laughs> day after day of of you know three star after three star place um but uh, no i think the the atmosphere um, varies a lot. I mean, I think there, there were one or two places. I remember a place in Switzerland that's actually changed significantly since then, but I remember Sammy's some you know, pretty snooty service there. Um, and there's still, even to this day, there's one restaurant called Amboisie in Paris, which is a terrific restaurant, but they, they do have a very kind of sort of quite stiff sort of service. Um, but that's just, you know, a feature, I guess, of something they're trying to do. Um, and that's generally not the case. Um, and, and I think it, it's maybe things have become a little bit more relaxed over the years as well um, but I think even even 20 years ago um, you know majority of restaurants were you know they, they were they were you know, trying to you know basically make you feel at home I mean that's the whole point of hospitality yeah. industry um, so I don't think that many places were, were trying to be difficult or snooty uh, there's been you know, say the odd, odd exception but uh, it's fairly unusual yeah I suppose, mm. I suppose the, the, those types of restaurants are portrayed as as intimidating places aren't they more than anything but I guess they're not because people go back Yes, I mean, if basis, <laughs> I mean, if you're a rest, you know, restaurant, ultimately is a business, so mm. you need to get, you know, basically happy returning customers. <laughs> so if you make it intimidating, then uh, that's that's not a great business model, really. Um, so you know, you've got to understand your audience, and, and you know, you may be aiming at a particular type of audience. Um, you know, it might be different age groups or you know, different levels of formality depending on the restaurant. Um, but clearly, the the whole point is to to get customers to yeah. to come and to come back. So you're working at Shell. And then you're obviously traveling the world, going to these lovely restaurants, and then you just start writing about them. How did that start? Like, you know, how did you sort of get into that? Because obviously that was still before you had a website, I'm guessing. Yeah, as I say, it began with a newsletter that led to a book. And then, then the, um, once I wrote the, read, wrote the book, then I put the, news, the yeah. website up, you know, very soon after the, after the book was published. And then, you know, I basically kept, you know, the website was essentially my online diary, basically, yeah. where I've been. Um, and and that's, that's something I've, I've done ever since so for you know for over sort of 25 years now and and what's the key difference between you and let's say newspaper reviewers i think um the sort of key difference is um that 
newspaper reviewers are there to write entertaining copy that sells newspapers. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not necessarily, um, they may be trying to do this as well, but they're not necessarily sort of primarily focused on, you know, assessing a restaurant objectively and still, you know, is it a place you want to go or not. Um, Their their, their job is to sell newspapers or help sell newspapers. Um, Whereas my... Sort of, you know, because I don't have that constraint, um, and in probably not as good a, a writer as some of them as well. Um, I mean, my reviews are more about the, you know, the, the food itself, and the, uh, you know, sort of trying to be reasonably objective about the standard of the of, of the food, the ingredients, the cooking, and so on. Um, because what I'm trying to do is to put a, you know, website out there which people will come back to because they find it useful, basically. Because when they're going to a city, they perhaps don't know. Um, you know, they can look up mine on my site and uh, hopefully find you know suggestions and you know in some cases you know places to avoid as well. Mm. Um, so it's it's um it's something it's, it's a different focus. I'm, I'm you know I'm, you know they they my reviews are probably you know less entertaining than than some um, in some ways, but that's not quite what I'm trying to do. No, well they are informative and that's the difference. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, that's the, the point, is to try to help somebody decide whether they want to eat at the restaurant or not, basically, yeah. and spend, spend money there. So that's really the, the objective. That's the difference, I think. So you've got your website, and then you also write for Elite Traveller magazine? Yes, I mean, yeah. I do freelance writing for a series of things. So yeah. I've done for seven years being the restaurant critic for Elite Traveller, which is an airline magazine. Um, um, but I've, 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 I'd also do other bits of writing for um, assorted magazines and written sort of bits of books and, and so on. So I, I, you know, it, it, on a sort of freelance basis, it's whatever, whatever sort of comes through the door, really. Yeah, no, of course. So <clears throat> I'm really intrigued about the, re- the review process itself. So can you sort of delve into a little bit about how you... How, you know the process of reviewing. Okay. Um, so let, let's start. How would you book? You know, would you use your name? You know, all of those little things that we all have myths about. Okay. Well, I mean, the first thing is certainly which places to review, and that's that's not trivial because there is obviously a lot of places out there. Um, um, I'm sort of reasonably lucky as I've had over the years I've built up a, a reasonable sort of following on the, the website and so I get a lot of feedback and I've got a fairly large network of sort of you know food foodie you know kind of you know friends and people who correspond with me um, so I get lots and lots of tips and suggestions from from people um, then obviously you get sent you know sort of press releases about new restaurants and so yeah. on as well um, but once you actually um, decide to review somewhere um, I, I think none of the print reviewers are anonymous apart from Marina O'Clockland um, and in my case that wasn't an option in any way because I had a you know n- not hugely but reasonably high profile sort of career in the IT industry I was a sort of CEO of a software company I was, <laughs> I was on CNN and you know and, and, and CNBC and other TV things so my photo was out there anyway so there was absolutely no point in me trying to uh, be anonymous um, um, and and to be honest with you it doesn't really matter because uh, I don't score in my system I don't score mm. the service at yeah. all so we can talk about maybe the you know, the, the aspects of the review um, and the only thing if you turn up on the night and um, they realise that you know you're you're there as a reviewer then you know they can perhaps put you in a nice table and you know be nice to you in terms of the, the waiter but you know they're not going to go and hire a better chef in a well, new, new kitchen Oh I was chatting to a chef um, that is coming on the podcast in a few months and we were chatting yesterday and I, I asked him I says oh well what do you do when a reviewer comes in or when um, you're you know you're serving a Michelin guide um, uh, reviewer or assessor and he says um, there's not much you can do he goes you've got to put the faith in the systems he goes I'm not going to go get better butter out of the fridge I'm not going to get you know the best frying pan he goes it's just mm-hmm. the systems are in place you can't you yeah. know, so you've got to trust the system yeah exactly and, and you know I, and I, I, I book, you know I'll sometimes you know um, book in other people's names because cause it's you know, I'm just going with friends and it's, it's their reservation yeah. so it's, 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 it's you know it, sometimes I'm apparently anonymous in that sense but other, other times I'm not um, but they find in reality restaurants you know they're either 
either interested in reviews or they're not. And the ones who are interested know who you are. Um, it just doesn't matter what measures you take. Um, I, I walked into a restaurant in Chicago a few years ago um, under a different reservation name, a place I've never been to before. Um, I was best about to give the name of the reservation, and the, the receptionist said, "Oh, Mr. Haler, it's an honour to have you here." <laughs> you know, so there's there's nothing, and I've had that in other sort of countries as well. So I think there's places which you know, which who who, who are, you know they they follow the blogs and they follow you know, yeah. Instagram and they care about people, and others who don't. You know, so if I go into a place in Japan. And then you know, in, in almost almost completely certainly, they have absolutely no, no uh, awareness that I write about restaurants, nor do they do they care. Yeah. Um, so, um, but the, the places that are bored about those things, they'll, they'll find out who you are, whatever it, you know, whatever you do. Obviously, no, you're coming as a guest, but they don't know anything else. And even if they do, like you say, they can't. What they're going to do? They're not going to go hire a better chef in a night, are they? Yeah, you know? Exactly. So, I mean, once I'm actually, you know, and in the in the restaurant, I mean, they essentially talk about the the process of the review. Um, I mean, I'm basically looking at each dish um, f- with really four things in mind. Um, so I'm looking at the ingredient quality. I'll talk about each of these, mm-hmm. but to, um, looking at the ingredient quality, looking at the sort of technical skill of the chef, um, the presentation of the dishes, and the what I would call the sort of the balance of the dish, or possibly you know, the harmony of the dish, however we want to say it. And so what I mean by those, um, so ingredient quality is hopefully reasonably obvious. Um, you know, certainly, if you eat out enough, you can start to figure out that. You know, a diver caught scallop from the Orkneys um, that's just alive in the kitchen before it was, you know, prepared. You know, tastes very different from a um, you know, trawler dredged frozen scallop. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, you know, with the latter not having any sort of sweetness. Um, you know, similarly, there are different you know, meat suppliers of dramatically different standards. You know, so if you have sort of chicken from I don't know Bress or from the Lond. Um, you know, those are high-end, expensive um, sort of birds and are just frankly going to taste a great deal better than the kind of catering supplier sort of chicken. So so it's, you know, reasonably obvious, um, you know, those sort of ingredients and, and I think just just experience tells you, you know, um, you know how good or otherwise those are. Um, then, you know, technical skill, I mean, again, it's nothing nothing rocket science about this i mean you know was the fish correctly cooked you know was it you know was it sort of semi-raw was it overcooked you know it's, it's, it's not difficult for any any anybody you know to sort of figure out mm-hmm. basically you know, the, the basic technical sort of skills obviously in some cases you can see there's more skill involved than others you know so some sort of pastry things can be quite complicated to make um and you can gauge that <clears throat> but i think that does you know, come with a little bit of experience of, of eating um, and then the uh, sort of presentation. I think it's sort of a, maybe not the biggest factor, but but I think it is nice if a if a plate sort of attractively put put together. I yeah. think you know we all sort of <clears throat> look at the plate before we we eat. Um, so I you know I, I do sort of bear that in mind. Um, and then the sort of well, when I'm talking about the harmony of the dish, I mean the balance of the dish. You know, are there <clears throat> you know flavours that sort of naturally sort of go together? You know, so uh, I don't know, um, you know strawberries and cream go together. Yeah. Let's, let's put it that way. You know, whereas perhaps you know raspberries and lamb less obviously <laughs> so something like that you know and, and also are there sort of you know too many or too few and in most cases it's too many sort of flavors um on the plate or things that clash and don't sort of really work together and i think it is a, a very common problem with um a lot of chefs especially on the way sort of up in their career is they try to sort of over complicate dishes if they're trying to get a star or a second star or something um in actual fact if you spend time eating in really high-end sort of restaurants then in a great many cases the the food's actually quite simple I mean, it's just you know perfectly executed so you get someone like uh, a chef like michel gerard who's had you know three stars for 42 years now um you know you often just get three things on the plate but they're three perfect things and they're they're all sort of in in great balance um, so those are the four aspects that I really look at. So why is it you don't look at service? Oh, simply because <clears throat> service is um, unlike the food, which will, should, at least in theory, be pretty much consistent from night to night. And certainly that's what restaurants are aiming for. Yeah. Um, um, you know, service, realistically, is not going to be that consistent, um, probably. Um, and it's also somewhat a personal thing. So, you know, for, what, for some people... That somebody might you know regard the waiter as sort of being 
you know, the too chatty or something, or, or over attentive, or, or, yeah. or that. And someone else thinks, oh, it's great they were paying attention to me. That's fantastic, <laughs> you know. Or they're too serious, or they're not serious enough, or whatever. And and, and it's you know, it's, it's like like decor of the restaurant. I mean, you know, is, is it relevant? Yeah, sure. For, for you know, for for a lot of people, it is relevant. Um, but the question is, <clears throat> you know, what the decor that I might happen to like isn't necessarily the one that you happen to like, and it's not it's not a right or a wrong. You know? Some of the reviewers that I've read, uh, you know, newspaper <clears throat> ones, they will say. <clears throat> Oh, the, the you know the look of the room was ghastly or not like mm. and and yeah. you I've read quite a few of your reviews last night and mm. nowhere did you ever comment on no I, and I don't because um, because I take photos yeah. <laughs> so you know if I, I can either spend you know sort of a paragraph trying to describe the you know colour of the wallpaper or the you know, thickness of the carpet um, but it's a lot easier just to take a photo of the dining yeah. room and let people judge for themselves whether they is the kind of place that they they want to uh, to eat and so I think the the whole thing of of um, you know uh, of, of having photos on a blog you know it renders the some of the description kind of superfluous really um, and I don't spend much time on it for the simple reason as I say I think it's a matter of personal taste whereas there's, there's no question as to whether you know you know the duck was overcooked or not mm. you know it's either pink or it's grey you know yeah. <laughs> there's no debate about that um, so um, that, that's, that's why I don't spend time so on it. So you take your camera out you take photos no one gives you the funny look or anything? Oh, I think um these days, it's it's, it's it's almost the opposite. There was a New Yorker cartoon a couple, few couple of years ago that came out and had this you know restaurant setting with a couple and a waiter, and the waiter comes over and says, "Is everything okay with the food? I notice you're not taking any photos." Um, so I think these days, um, it's it's you know extremely common, you know almost universal <clears throat> for people to take photos of their food. I mean, it was a little bit different ten years ago. Um, you know, you'd get the occasional quizzical look, um, but I've, I've almost never had a, an issue with that. I I think some dining rooms or restaurants have some have an issue with the photos like as in from guests and then others just say let customers do what they want to do as long as they're not on the phone or you know using the flash or yeah al- almost nobody has a problem with, with with photos in restaurants I mean they <clears throat> I can literally name you know a tiny tiny number in all the hundreds and you know thousands of meals I've had <clears throat> I can think of about two or three occasions where there's been an issue um, and they're almost always pretty spurious um, issues um, one place that they, they thought that they their food was the, was the copyright of the chef, which is complete gibberish in, <laughs> in, in legal terms, which is nonsense. And um, and of course, nobody takes flash because, because flash doesn't work in restaurants anyway yeah. because the, the it reflects off the plate, so you get yeah. hideous pictures if you, if you use flash. That would be that would obviously be kind of rude to yeah, of course. use flash, um, but nobody does that anyway. Do you use camera or iPhone? I use a uh, camera. Um, uh, I'm not a sort of professional photographer, but um, certainly over the years, the, there's no question that the, the iPhone camera has got better and better mm. and better and better. Um, they used to be sort of hideous. Now they're, they're actually very, really quite good. Um, however, they're not yet at the stage of taking same quality pictures as a, a good sort of camera, mm. particularly in low light. So yeah. I think if you're sitting there in sort of you know daylight and you know nice nice lit conditions, then you know yes you've taken an excellent picture with the uh, with the phone. Um, but if you're in a sort of slightly murky environment, then you're um, you know both you know both a phone or a camera will suffer you know, relative yeah. to being in good light um but the camera has got more uh, more of a fighting chance of taking a decent so do you have picture. a camera with uh, like a nice uh, with with interchangeable mm. lenses so you can uh, get some good low light iso low light I, um i actually as i'm not a photographer and i i um i have you know, i do possess a, a dslr but i i've kind of given up using that quite a long time ago um i i find it sort of compromised now with a um camera the sony rx yeah. 100 one I use is a compact camera, so it's it's small enough that you can fit in your pocket. Um, so unlike an SLR, which is you have to carry around a big case <laughs> and it's like a you know it's a big weighty thing with lenses and whatever. Um, and whereas you know the the the, um, the Sony, I can just you know put it out of your pocket, take a quick picture, and you're not you know not you, causing any any you, kind of fuss. You can be an inobtrusive. Yeah, it's exactly unobtrusive. And and the um, the the this particular camera has got a particularly large sensor. Uh, that's why it was you know. Uh, it, you know, it was really it was very innovative for its class of camera. Um, and of course, there are different cameras, and you know, yeah. uh, other ones are some other ones are excellent as well. But that's just the one that that's I, the one I, you, I use at the yeah. moment. So, what are the differences between <coughs> the Michelin Guide, the AA Guide, and the Good Food Guide? What, what would you say? You know, are there any striking <coughs> differences, or are they just different guides? Um, yeah, I mean, they've got <coughs> different sort of um, sort of audiences, I guess. Um, they, I think the 
take those in sort of sequence. The the AA guide is, um, I would say, primarily aimed at trade mm-hmm. rather than customers, though uh, they may see, see it differently. But certainly as a consumer, uh, I... I really wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, what place has got three rosettes and four rosettes. Mm. Um, and I don't think terribly many people in the street could either. Um, they primarily um, review hotels, you know, obviously, but they do do restaurants as well. Yeah. Um, but they make, you know, but their business model is all about the hotels. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's a thing that the chefs are kind of interested in in the UK. They, they can sort of, you know, they would like to get a, you know, I mean, everyone likes to get, get awards, don't they? So yeah. if you get a three or four, that's whatever, that's, that's a nice thing to get. I, I doubt it makes any, any difference of almost any significance to the, to the revenues of the restaurant. Um, whereas the, um, Good Food Garden and Michelin are, um, aimed more at consumers. Um, so the, <clears throat> the Good Food Garden has been around, you know, since the sort of 50s, really, um, and sort of a lot of history. Um, they do have um, anonymous inspectors, um, um, but they're part-time. Mm-hmm. They're, not, they're not sort of full-time people in the trade. They're just kind of enthusiasts, basically, who, um, you know, they pay them a very small amount of money or they pay them in their expenses um and they they write reviews and and that's the basis of it um and and that's clearly got a you know sort of consumer focus um these days it's been bought out by a few years ago by, by waitress magazine it used to be owned by which um but the good Feel guide you know does have a sort of you know independent um sort of inspection process and i think that's very unusual compared to a lot of other guides um the other um, guide that famously does have, you know, um, independent anonymous inspections is the is, is Michelin, and that's really the one that <clears throat> probably the chefs have most had most sort of time for, um, and it's because of the fact that you, unlike a lot of other guides, um, you can't really sort of buy influence in in Michelin. You you know, you, if you take a bunch of advertising out in, you know, certain magazines, mm-hmm. then. Um, you know, you'll mysteriously get a, you know, better, you know, better reviews. And I, I know this for a fact, having known people who worked in some of these magazines. Um, whereas, you know, Michelin don't take any advertising. They don't take any fees for the for their entries. Um, they, their inspectors are anonymous and they're, they're basically ex-hotel, hotel graduates essentially um, and they, they they work full time for Michelin doing about 200 inspections a year typically wow. um, and and because of that you know I think what ob- objective sort of process at least in theory um, you know uh, the sort of chefs kind of know that they can't kind of just buy a star um, therefore therefore it's respected and you know the guy's been going since 1900 and <clears throat> in the UK since 1974 um, and um, it's you know it's, it's, it's you know it's the most I think respected of the you know of those um, of of the guides. Um, then of course you've got a whole range of other you know kinds of guides and some you know that you know take some kind of they're more marketing things where you know you you know you take some kind of fee mm-hmm. you know for having an entry and other things. Of course these days you have you know the whole world of social media with um, TripAdvisor yeah. and um, Yelp and, and 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 other other things like that. So do you ever look at TripAdvisor before you go to a restaurant? I find TripAdvisor not terribly helpful for restaurants. It, it's interesting, so I actually, I'm not, I, I don't want to seem as if I'm criticising TripAdvisor because I, I actually do use it quite yeah. a lot for um, when I'm choosing a hotel. So I'm going to a city I don't know, I will definitely look at the <clears throat> um, TripAdvisor reviews for that. Um, for some reason, it seems to work quite well for hotels, <clears throat> um, but not very well for restaurants. And I, I'm, not, I'm, never, I'm not entirely sure I understand why. Um, it may be that there is a <clears throat> some sort of issue of price performance expectation mm-hmm. with restaurants that people have a lot more problems have, have a lot of people have more difficulty with, you know, they, they don't feel they get value for money from certain types of restaurants or something. But whereas with a hotel, you kind of, you know, it, 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 you kind of know what you're going to get if yeah. you stay at a Sheraton or something. You know, you, you, you have a rough idea as to how much it's going to cost and roughly, you know, what kind of hotel it's going to be. So, yeah, so then you're just into the sort of, well, is this particular Sheraton any good or not? Um, whereas with restaurants, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you do get a lot more sort of violently opposing 
you know, kind of reviews and there's mm. a little five star everything's fantastic to you know one star it was terrible um, and, and I think with TripAdvisor on the restaurant side there is there was also the sort of the thorny issue of kind of manipulation mm. of the reviews which is, is you know without a doubt happens um, and I think I mean you know TripAdvisor would acknowledge that as well um, that they sort of claim they've got systems to try to counter that, but but you know there are clearly well documented examples where you know restaurants have been you know entirely fake restaurants have mysteriously ended up very high on TripAdvisor. Mm. So um, so it, it's it's a it's a problem. And I, I just I just you know, if you look at the an area obviously I live in London, so I know the London restaurants seem pretty well. If I look at the top sort of ten on TripAdvisor, which I occasionally do, you know it just it just bears no relationship to anything that I I understand. Yeah. So so therefore I just don't use it yeah it makes sense and i think i think there's people that will review anything you know i mean like you know there's people that are, uh, review car parks on TripAdvisor. <laughs> you know and you think you know, if someone's got that much spare time on their hands you're never going to win against that argument it's like when we were starting just before we were starting we were saying you don't argue with people on twitter because you're never going to change their mind and i think that's the same mm. with someone who who is literally going to take five minutes out of their time to review a car park you are never going to change their mind about the meal they just had you know I don't, so w- w- would you say and I, you know, this is not your expertise but would you say that people should engage and talk to people on TripAdvisor or not or just play it by ear oh I, I yeah I don't know how to, how to answer that really I mean the um, clearly some restaurants and hotels you know reply to every every TripAdvisor post and some don't and, yeah. and you know honestly I don't really I don't really know what the right uh, solution so, is so getting back to the uh, the Michelin Guide for example what give us some misconceptions <laughs> that people have some myths because well, one that I told you about when we were setting up and that was the uh, the fork or spoon on the floor malarkey so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I think I, I only believe that's a um, the, 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 there's this sort of you know urban myth that you know Michelin Inspector you know, takes the fork and they <laughs> stuff it on the floor and see whether the waiters notice or something. And and, and this is as far as I know is just you know, nonsense. And um, <laughs> it, it, Michelin, it, it was actually asked of Michelin once you know, in an interview, and they they just all laughed and said, "No, no you, you must be mad," you know. So no, I think that's a, that's nonsense. Um, I think the the first mo- more important kind of you know myth about Michelin. <clears throat> um, is that it's somehow all about sort of you know French food mm. and there's some sort of you know bias about about it being for French and I think that's you know patently false you know there's lots of issues you can have with Michelin but I think this is not one of them um, so for example um, you know, for years there was sort of mis- you know perception that you know to get a second or third star you'd have to have incredibly posh dining room and you know beautiful wine glasses and and, and so on. Um, and certainly that was an argument used by chefs to restaurateurs saying, that oh, the reason I haven't got my second star is that, you know, the, the dining room is not, you haven't invested enough money in all these uh, accoutrements <laughs> rather than maybe made the fact that the cooking wasn't good enough. Um, and, and I think it's basically that that is something which is increasingly obvious is not true because, you know, if you go to, say, Japan and you go to, well, it's moved recently, but if you go to, went a few years ago to Sushi Saito, which is a three-star Michelin restaurant in Tokyo and in fact is the highest rated um, sushi restaurant in, in Japan uh, on the local site Tabalog um, that was literally a seven seat restaurant in a car park and what well, I mean in a car park I mean it was uh, in a sort of NCP type car park wow. so you went under you know walked past the you know little the, the barrier and you sort of looked in the corner and there was a little sort of what looked like a janitor's closet and you opened it open up the, with just a tiny little sign in Japanese and then you opened up the door and inside was a little bar um sort of counter and and there was a you know chef you know making making great sushi now you know that that certainly did not have you know posh morning glasses and it didn't have grand decor and you know chandeliers and <laughs> grand pianos in the corner um but yet that got three michelin stars so so i think that's a sort of proof really um it was close to the car park though yes handy <laughs> handy for the car park exactly um, so, so do you think Many would say that the cynics would say, oh, they do that for the PR, like, oh, look at this. But, you know, there's got to be lots of examples where lots of restaurants have got it without a great dining room or, or these yeah, posh well, I mean, look, you look at, in the UK, I mean, look at the Fat Duck. I mean, you know, that, that, I mean nobody's going to accuse the Fat Duck of having spent money on the decor. Mm. You know, I mean, it's a very ordinary dining room. Um, and, you know, yet it has three stars. You know, so yeah. I mean, as I said, there's so many counter examples 
to this. That it, I, I just don't know why anybody would be under that impression. Mm. I simply don't. I mean, they've given stars to endless places that are, you know, have have very basic decor. So there's this, it's, it's dozens of counter examples. So I think that's just a completely so nonsensical thing. Do the guides carry as much weight as they mm. used to, or do they carry more? I, I think it's the difference. You know, if I go back over the time I've been sort of eating and dining as a consumer, is that you know, say, sort of twenty years ago, when I, when I first went to Japan in nineteen ninety six, um, it was exceptionally difficult to find information, you know, at least in English um, about restaurants in Tokyo yeah. and, and and elsewhere. Um, there was essentially nothing. There was no Michelin, and you know, there was some, all you could really buy was a kind of general tourist guide, you know, sort of you know. Bodor's Guide or something, mm. you know, um, you know, and those, those places don't special specialize in in restaurants. Um, so, th- what the contrast is that you know, you've now got not only sort of Michelin, which has expanded radically in its kind of coverage, and that covers much of Japan um, and, and lots of other places as well, not just Europe anymore. Um, but you've clearly got a sort of huge variety of other possible sources. So you've got you've got blogs like mine. You know, mm-hmm. you've got. Um, um, local guides, of course, you, you've really always always had that. Like, you, you a good food guide in the UK or Gambra Rosso in, in Italy, whatever. Um, but you've also now got sort of, sort of social media as well. So you've got you know the TripAdvisors, the Yelps, the ones that are sort of crowdsourcing type type mm. things like Hartman's in the UK or what used to be Zagat in in the US, which is it's, it's been bought and sold a couple of times now. Um, but there's clearly. Um, you know, you've <clears throat> now you've got a, a much bigger range of of kind of possible sources to look at if you're trying to assess things. So now you've got the problem. It's not well, it's a problem. It used to be a problem of scarcity in the that you just couldn't find any reviews of anything mm. in, in in obscure enough places. You've now got the opposite problem where you've actually got too many yeah. reviews and, and many of them you know contradict each other and so on. So so in a sense, the role has changed from being the you know the sort of the only source of information about. You know, restaurant in some dusty corner of, of France. Um, you've now got loads and loads of choices about that. Um, but the difference is that <clears throat> the Michelin, you know, at least has an inspection process. So, yeah. you know, you know, you may not always agree with Michelin's assessment. And I certainly always don't always. But the at least, you know, the the inspection process is, you know, is it probably as as fair a way as you could reasonably design it. So, you know, you have a, you know, in theory, multiple well, that remains to be seen. But in theory, multiple, you know, anonymous reviews, you know, in a year. Um, by people who do it for a living. I mean, I, I mean, how else? You know, how would you design a guide better than that? You mm. know, so you know, there, there are issues of execution, and I, and I think there are some some genuine issues with Michelin, uh, which are which are a bit different. We perhaps get on to, um, but the um, but I think the process is is at least you know it's kind of fair. Whereas you know you know with social media, it's obviously it's either one person's opinion or you know it's a, a bunch of you know sort of You're trying to figure out which of these reviews five star to one star makes any sense you know so so now now i think the the the, the professional guys like michelin um you know i think have a sort of authority if you like which um um, which give you some sort of you know some sort of credibility as to you know, yeah. do, I, do I believe Michelin or do I believe TripAdvisor? You know, I would probably go with Michelin most of the time. Yeah, of course. And have you ever had it where you've been to I don't know a two star or a three star, and you've read upon it on the, you know, and they're, mm. they're glowing reports, and you go there mm. and it's just mm. a complete opposite. Yeah, I certainly have. You have occasional horror meals. I mean, you shouldn't do obviously <laughs> in theory, but you do. Um, so I had a particularly gruesome uh, experience in a. A place that had just been promoted to two stars in in the Black Forest a couple of years ago, and and went there with with an American friend who was very well travelled, and um, you know it was a normal evening, and the chef was in, and it wasn't like he had a night off or anything, and 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 yeah, basically the food was really terrible. I mean, there was just no two ways about it. We had quite a few dishes, and they were <laughs> pretty much all bad. You know, and uh, yeah, that was that was a very peculiar. Um, meal, so it would be expensive, but it was it was you know there was all all kinds of issues, um, and that sort sort of thing. There's just I think Michelin occasionally just get it wrong, yeah. and, and 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 to be fair, they demoted it the next year and so on. So, you know, they, they should have taken probably the both stars away rather than just one, in my opinion. But but I mean at least they did something about it, um, and in general they they will correct you know really glaring errors, um, you know usually anyway, um, given enough time. Um, so they, at least they do sort of respond to sort of feedback. So, so one website said, 
and I don't know how accurate this is, that you dislike the Michelin Guide. Well, it, 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 no, I don't dislike the Michelin Guide. I, I think there are issues with it, as, as I mentioned. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the, the frustration is, is as, as I say, I think if you were going to design a restaurant guide in terms of an inspection process, you would end up with the Michelin process, because mm-hmm. I don't really know how you can do it any better than that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the frustration is in the, their execution of that process, which still throws up, you know, some very problematic answers yeah um and like this place i I mentioned for example and that's quite irritating because you know you go there and you spend money and travel there and it's all you know and and then you have a really bad meal and you think well how did that happen and that's the whole point of a supposed to be the whole point of michelin guard is that someone's gone and you know done some qa quality control for you um so i think the 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 issues that i i I will have with michelin are much more in the some of the newer guides, um, as they've expanded outside of Europe, um, <clears throat> where they have um, exposed themselves, I think, to a real conflict of interest in the last few years, where they um, almost all of the recent newer guides have been paid for by tourist boards. Mm. So certainly the guide to um, Thailand, to Bangkok, the guide to Seoul, the guide to Shanghai, and even the latest guide to California, which is, I, I was unaware of until recently, yeah, was was paid for by the in this case by the Californian Tourist Board. Obviously, the you know, Thai Tourist Board will pay for the for the Bangkok guide and so on. And and I think the difficulty there is that while the you know the the Bangkok Tourist Board isn't or Thai Tourist Board isn't telling Michelin which places to give stars to, um, the the very fact that they're paying you know very substantial sums of money, I mean millions of dollars, um, means that. At the very least, the inspectors are probably going to feel sort of obliged to find a, a decent selection of places that they're going to give stars to. You know, I mean, if you did a, you know, if you just hand over five million dollars for a guide and they came out and said, "Well, oh, well, we've been to the, we've been to your city, and I'm, I'm really sorry, but there's none, no, nowhere that's worth a star." Yeah, you know, you would kind of be pretty annoyed, and you'd want want your money back. Um, and then, you know, that that that's, I mean, that's obviously being you know extreme, but I mean, essentially, I think it does put um, pressure on. On Michelin to you know to overscore, mm. and I think if you go to, I mean, I give the example of Shanghai guide you know, I went to you know a year ago, um, almost exactly a year now, um, and you know I went to all of the at the time there were six two stars and one three star, um, and you know none of them you know oh sorry there was two three stars I'm sorry at that time um, one apart from the one three star ultraviolet which was very good. Um, the other three star and all the two stars were, you know, pretty pretty dubious. I would say, mm. um, in terms of if you took them uh, out and put them in France, you know, they wouldn't have the same score. They just yeah. they just wouldn't, you know. Um, and that, that's that's to me an example where you know there, there was a <clears throat> you know uh, you know the, that sort of you know payment has kind of compromised in my view. You know the the, the Michelin process because like, I, I don't understand it. Other, it's either it's either that or it's incompetence. I, yeah. I, I hope it's I hope it's not that. Um, and, and I think you can see if you if you if you want sort of proof if you if you, if you like. I mean it's, I mean there is no such thing as you know there's there's no science behind restaurant inspections. So I can't prove to you somewhere's one star or two star, mm. but I can give you one really shining example, um, which is the um, the Atelier Robichon chain. So, I say, Joe Robichon you know, sadly passed away uh, a while back, but he uh, he set up a successful group of um, sort of high end sort of restaurants. Um, but nonetheless, they are a chain, so they're, they're very different price point to yeah. McDonald's, you know. But they are a chain, and they if you go walk into an Italian Robichon in um, you know in Paris or one in, in Tokyo or, or one in Shanghai, they or one in Hong Kong or wherever. They look identical. Mm-hmm. You know, the decor is essentially, you know, the same colour scheme, everything's in the same style. The menu may not be exactly identical, maybe some small local variations, but many of the dishes are literally identical. Wow. Many of the, um, the recipes, for sure, are identical. Um, and so, you know, of all of the, you know, the places in the world, you would assume that that would have the same rating pretty much everywhere. Yeah. 
And the actual fact, if you trundle around to these different places, you know, the one in, in London before it closed recently had you know, one star, um, the one in so it's like Tokyo has two stars, and the one in Hong Kong has three three stars and you know believe me having been to all of them you know there, there is no justification for that that difference the, mm. the one, one in hong kong was in, in no way better than the one in in london <clears throat> was in no way better than the one in in, in paris um you know so that's a uh, that's something where <clears throat> you know literally a chain has been given completely different scores in you know in in some of the newer asian guides yeah, then, then then they get elsewhere, and and that just to me just is just just nonsense, basically. Um, so so something so, has gone wrong. So they're the a process. bit more, yeah, and yeah, it looks like they're a bit more liberal in those countries. Then there's got to be some reason behind it, like you say, it's either incompetence or, or like you say, because someone's paying for the the book, let's say, to get it printed. But do um, so mm. would if we just focus on like the Michelin guy, do, do mm. does um, one of their assessors do just UK only, France only, or would they literally do all sorts of different ones and mix it around countries? Well, Michelin are extremely uh, cagey about their um, their sort of internal process. So um, the it is from odd interviews they've given over the years, and I've just you know sort of being a sort of Michelin kind of groupie, if you like. I do follow these things. Mm-hmm. Um, it, is, it is clear that there is a, a certainly a degree of um, cross fertilization of inspectors so you know uk inspector might do mostly uk but will also do some some in other countries um, and, and from what i understand certainly in europe then there's significant cross fertilization so that you know if you and particularly at the sort of two or three star level if someone's going to promote somewhere you know from one to two stars then they my understanding is that they'll they'll get at least one mm. expected from another country to sort of validate that yeah what is not clear as to how much that happens between the continents because that would be i'm assuming super expensive for them to do um and i'm sure they do the occasional sort of jaunt off to hong kong or japan or something but um but in terms of you know are, are inspectors in france regularly going to japan and vice versa you know are they are they <clears throat> doing a significant number of the reviews I'm, i presume the answer is probably not mm. um and so <clears throat> so i think you know i'm sure that you know just from sheer economics would dictate that the um that the, the vast majority at least of the inspections are done by people in their own continent at the very least and, and probably in their own country um and um yeah, I that mm-hmm. So if we look at, if we jump over back to newspaper reviewers, a friend of mine's a chef and he feels that, he's got no proof obviously, well, it feels like it's proof, but he feels that there is a bit of a mm. herd mentality that if one mm. reviewer goes into a restaurant and says, fantastic, mm. everyone generally comes out and says, mm. it's fantastic. But if someone goes in there and says, oh no, I didn't like that place, mm. then everyone jumps on the back of that bandwagon. Um, mm. Uh, do you think that's a thing with the newspaper reviewers? Would you say? Um, I think it varies. I mean, you, you have, you have I have seen counter examples of that, um, but there's probably a, a degree of, of truth in that. Um, um, yeah, um, I, th- I think it's sort of quite often that's the case. I mean, it may just be that they're, they're all you know they they all agree because that's because <laughs> they they all have the same opinion. Yeah, and that, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, th- I think there will there may well be a, a sort of slight tendency towards that, and I think some of the newspaper reviewers are more, um, let's say, more foodie than others. Let's mm-hmm. Put it that way. So I think when you know someone like Marina O'Clockan reviews somewhere, and she's generally respected as the the most foodie of the of the newspaper critics. Um, you know, then <clears throat> if she likes somewhere, then it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of the other newspaper critics may feel less comfortable, you know, disagreeing with her. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And is there anything that you sort of, um, <clears throat> yeah, dislike about the food critics or restaurant critics scene? Well, um, not, not hugely. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think the, uh, like I said, I mean, as a consumer, I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, restaurant critics for me are in, in newspapers. They're they're there to to write entertaining copy. You know, um, so you know, I'll read a review in whatever it is, the the, the, the Guardian or the, the Sunday Times or whatever, um, <clears throat> because I want to be entertained. It, it doesn't, you know, from my perspective, that's not they're not necessarily um, my sources of where to eat. Mm. You know, I mean, I would rather. You know, trust people that I have got to know over the years and who eat out widely and pay their own bills, um, and who have got maybe at least a 
a similar palette to mine, mm-hmm. you know, and I've you know discovered that over the years. I, I would always go for one of those people over a, 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 over a newspaper review. So if we flip the argument on its head about all reviewers doing the same thing and being heard, let's say, how defensive can chefs be with reviews? Um, I think it depends a lot on the chef, but I mean, some of them can be extremely uh, defensive um, and, you know, in some cases quite aggressive, really. Um, so I think, I think it, it varies a lot. Um, others are actually much more... Um, I think sort of you know realistic um, and you know I've certainly had some very I've actually had some sort of quite interesting feedback on some of my reviews you know um, including one restaurant where I you know it was well regarded by the newspaper critics let's put yeah. it that way but I had a pretty pretty bad meal um, and when I after I posted the review I was contacted by the PR agency of the restaurant and they were sort of you know polite and professional but very you know clearly you know disappointed at my <laughs> my clear lack of understanding of the genius of their chef um, whereas what was amusing to me was <clears throat> I had a direct sort of note from the, the chef himself who said, yeah, I was that there at that service and I remember it was a really crummy service and basically I agree with every single thing that you wrote. <laughs> so that was kind of so quite... put his hands up, yeah. Yeah, so actually admitted that, yeah, it was just a, a really sort of dodgy sort of meal. And that, But that's that's kind of, I think it's quite a big thing to do. It's, it's, I, yeah, I kind of admired the, 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 the chef for doing that. Um, but that doesn't happen terribly often. <laughs> no. so would you just, say most of the time it yeah. leans into the other camp where it's just like oh, that review is a knob or something like yeah I, th- I think quite often you know i mean I, of course it varies from chef to chef yeah. i don't want to generalize no I really of course don't. but i mean yes there are clearly examples where there's some pretty aggressive you know responses from from chefs who you know um you know i, I understand i mean you know there it's, it's a tough tough business you know being a chef it's yeah, long, long, right. long hours and all that and you know of course the, you know, the last thing they want is for some some somebody to come along and try you know sort of describe their food as bad you know yeah so i can understand what especially after a long, a long shift long week long year you know yeah they, they exactly yeah. and i think one of the things that you know my advice to chefs would be is is you know is to basically compose that whatever tweet you're about to, to do and then just leave it for two days then come mm. back to it and yeah. see whether you still want to send it two days later because i think a lot of these sort of twitter spats um or you know similar things are often in the sort of spur of the moment you know in the you know five minutes of sort of you know you know after they've read the review and and, and you know it, a lot of this sort of stuff is is you know is, is not necessary and if you just thought about it for a bit a bit from you know, rest you know had a went away and had a had a had a calming cup of tea you know then you, you might feel differently um so yeah so i think it varies hugely but clearly some some people get very distressed mm. um you know i think there was a famous example recently was uh uh, Marc Guevara in France who was a very was a legendary chef and I certainly was a big fan of his um, restaurant in Annecy about 20 years ago mm-hmm. um, and which had three Michelin stars and was deservedly so um, he had some he stopped that restaurant closed and he stopped cooking for quite some time he had some health issues uh, but now he's cooking again and <clears throat> he's opened a restaurant not very far away up in the in the sort of the hills uh, near Annecy uh, called Maison de Bois and uh, it got two Michelin stars, and when I went there, that felt kind of right. Um, but it, it, it then was given a third star, and and that didn't feel right at all to me. Um, and what was interesting was because when um, he got the third star, you know, he was all you know, well, you know, this of course is you know long, well deserved for my great, you know, <laughs> long, you know, genius, you know, so on. Um, but when they took the third star away this year. Um, just after a year, um, then you know he gave his you know, various interviews with French newspapers, saying what a bunch of complete incompetent idiots Michelin oh. were. <laughs> but the thing is, if they were that incompetent idiots, then why wasn't he saying that when they yeah. gave him the first star? You know, so, so I think you know sometimes the chefs don't really sort of think through their positions very clearly. Do, 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 can you go from <clears throat> three to one, or is it just three? Theoretically, two to one? you can. It's extremely unusual. So, can you go from one to three? Again, theoretically, you okay. can. It's extremely unusual. So the, the, it used to be the case that you couldn't. Right? Okay. So or at least, I mean, there was, you know, because Michelin don't publish anything, so, no. so it's still you guesswork. Know. But in terms of historical precedence, um, it used to be the case before they did their international expansion that it was always one, two, three. So, so the, you know, there's a couple of examples of this in, over the years. So Jean Bouchon went from one to two to three in three years. Alain Ducasse at Louis Cannes, or at least. Uh, at least he's his head chef there at the time. Um, 
took basically took it from one to two to three in three years and those were sort of you know legendary because there were such such rapid ascensions but in the in the asian guides it's you know all everything you know all the all the rules have been you know relaxed and yeah. so you know we, they had a, a particularly extreme example a few years ago in a Hong Kong guide a place called Sung Tung Lok which was not a new restaurant by any means been there about 40 years and it wasn't in the first edition of the Hong Kong guide either or you think even the second I think it was the third edition um, and it went from no stars to three which was peculiar a bit mildly um, and I went there and it was clearly you know nothing close to that you know um, and they there was, such, there was such sort of general outrage that they immediately demoted it the following year. But, I mean, it's, it, that was clearly just, you know, a real sort of horror show you, example. Think, see, the cynic in me tells me that there's a stunt there that, you know, it can't surely just be... I don't know, like, if... Especially in today's world of clickbait and outrage, why would mm. you do that? Why would, I, don't, I just I can't get my head around it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a mystery, and I, and, I, and I don't know. Unless it's the nephew of someone that works at the tourism board. Well... <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of rumours about the Hong Kong, Hong Kong guide, which, uh, oh, which really? I'm, I'm, I'm most certainly not going to re- repeat in, a, in that kind of session. But it's, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of let's just say that the Hong Kong guide is peculiarly unpredictable. Okay. Uh, of all the Michelin guides, it's, it's the ones I, I one I least trust. Um, basically, there's, mm. there's some very 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 strange things that have been happening for a long time in that guide. Interesting. And I don't have an explanation for it. Basically, you should set up a new blog, like a gossip page. If only there was some other guide, you blog, or website you could go to, which gave you more objective reviews. Yeah, so like, I think um, I know one. Well, like, yeah. the, well, I can think of. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, if you don't, you know, if you have those concerns, you mm. go go look at my my website. Of course. So moving on to a few more general things, what is your biggest dislike in a restaurant? Any restaurant, just. Hmm. Um. It's interesting. Um. I suppose. Um, sort of not caring about the customer, <laughs> you know. If I mean, which, as I say, is in general not something that happens, you know, um, because the whole point of restaurants is to get people to come and come back and spend money. <laughs> so of course, they, they in theory, um, they should all be very welcoming as mm. they're a business. Um, but you do occasionally get. Um, kind of completely you know sort of you know difficult you know front of house in particular because you don't tend to see the chefs you know so you, you experience the front of house um and i think you, you can get some very snooty and difficult and aggressive front of house um people on occasion it's, it's, it's quite unusual but it does happen and and you know when you're spending a lot of money that that's pretty annoying um, would you say that's, it's still a common thing today or would you say it was worse like let's say in the 90s early 90s when you started yeah, I don't think it's really changed that much. I mean, I, I don't think it's it's common actually. No. Um, anyway, um, and I don't think it's um, any worse or better really than, than than now than it was before. You know, I, I can think of examples of twenty years ago when I encountered sort of snooty, difficult service, but then I can think of some now where you know, in last year where I've encountered it as well. Um, I don't really think you know things have changed. I mean, perhaps things have become a little bit more relaxed in terms of high end mm. service in restaurants. There's a little bit less formality. Um, and so on so there's been a style that's changed a little bit over the years um but i think in terms of sort of outright sort of you know aggression um you know you know sort of for example you know, those of you who ever ate at harvey's which mm-hmm. is a, a legendary sort of two michelin star restaurant in london in wandsworth is now now shea bruce um then you know the front of house at harvey's were you know not cuddly mm. let's put it that way and and so while the food was fantastic uh, there and and really you know some of the best food I've eaten in the UK, um, you know they 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 seem to sort of take pleasure in making life miserable for their for their customers <laughs> um, in a way I never really understood and and it sort of meant that I ended up eating less there than I would than I did at say Shea mm. Nico where the food was you know of the same standard three star Michelin standard um, where they had nice nice service and so you know why would you put yourself through all that sort of aggravation, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think just, just you know, places that don't sort of <clears throat> seem to have forgotten that the customer's paying are the only things that really, really irritate me. I, I remember listening to, I think it was Desert Island Discs with uh, yeah. Shane Nico, and he said in his early days, in his prime, let's say, he, uh, <laughs> he ripped up customers' money, threw it on the floor. But I guess he probably just grew out of that, I'm guessing. I yeah, yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think Nico... Um, 
Yeah, I certainly went to his restaurant probably more than anybody in, in that era. Um, he had a whole series of... <clears throat> well, it was, it was only ever one sort of... Well, that's not true. Um, so he started off in, in, in a, a number of different places in South London, sort of Battersea and... Uh, and and then he moved to Victoria, and then he moved out to Shinfield, and then eventually back into central London. Um, and I certainly, you know, at most of those venues, and in some cases, um, and very very frequently at, at some of those venues. Um, and I actually never experienced that with with Nico. Um, but however, there's absolutely no debate that, <laughs> that he had a, a temper, and uh, um, and certainly there's plenty of stories about about uh, about him. And I think he, yeah, I think he sort of just grew up basically, mm. um, and and you know those those sort of things people do, and maybe when they're in their twenties and they they when they get a bit older, they realise it's just a bit sort of stupid. Mm. Um, so there are lots of Nico stories, but but it, you know people, you know, I mean it, he was an incredibly good cook, um, and. You know, I, I was fortunate that I never saw that. He was always extremely courteous to yeah. to me as a customer. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so he, he had a reputation for being a, a bit grumpy. Yeah. And where have you had surprisingly excellent service, but was just very surprised by that? Um, I think you can. It's always intriguing because you sort of assume that sort of high-end slick services as a preserve of sort of you know fancy multi star michelin restaurants i don't think that's really true um at all actually um i think you can get some very impressive service at some you know relatively simple sort of cheaper restaurants um i'll just pick one at random um there's a restaurant i go to in southall a lot called the brilliant um which is a sort of indie restaurant that's been there for about 40 50 years now actually yeah almost 50 years and um they just have a surprisingly slick service operation and uh, i'm not saying it's the best service operation mm-hmm. or anything in london but you know given it's usually about 25 30 pounds a head <laughs> including drinks you know it's not the place you'd expect you know to yeah. to see a, a smooth service operation um and yet despite it's sort of quite a large restaurant now um, it's somewhere where yeah they always you know seem to you know treat people very very well. Um, I mean there, there are I think other, many other examples. I'm sure it's just, yeah. just this one that sort of springs to mind. So, w- what chef stroke restaurateur has impressed you the most? Would you say in all your time? Um, I think in terms of the, the, the I didn't really ever have a better meal mm. than, than that first meal at Shaman actually, which is quite ironic after all the uh, uh, dining I've done since and having included now you know over on various occasions been to every every three star Michelin restaurant in the world. On so I think it's about I think it's about eight occasions now. Um, I didn't ne- I, yeah I never actually had a better meal than the, that first one, um, which is which is sort of um, sort of ironic. Um, but I think. Uh, I did go back many times to to Germain and uh, certainly probably about a dozen times um, before it eventually closed. Um, so it wasn't just you know a kind of a you know sort of a, you know I wasn't just dazzled by that by that, for that one meal. I, mm. I did did go there quite regularly, um, but I think the consistency of operation of of that kitchen was remarkable. Um, I think I've had dishes every bit as good um, at a whole pile of other restaurants actually um, but what's very unusual about about Germain, um was that it was a, it was to the same pretty much the same standard throughout the entire meal from every you know, sort of amuse bouche through to the starter through the main school through to the um, you know desserts um, everything was was faultless you know everything was the same extraordinarily high standard and that that's very very rare whereas often in a, in a meal you know even a very good three-star meal yeah you know, there'll be one dish that's particularly good and there's something else you think well that was sound was pretty good but not quite as good as the other dish and something else was you know nice but not you know not in that league yeah um and that that was the <clears throat> thing that was unusual for me about about Joanne was that you just have sort of highlight after highlight after highlight and nothing ever you know nothing ever, it was ever less than than remarkable it's pretty amazing to do it at that level for over such a long period. So one thing we mentioned when we met not long ago is that what well, you mentioned it is that you find that Japanese food is really just far more superior than sort of we're talking about the sourcing, the quality of the food. And you, you've noticed that you feel that it's just maybe I'm misconstruing it, but I'm well. I, what I was, I think, we mentioned was about the ingredients, yeah. particularly not necessarily sort of cooking. Um, but the, um, but I do think there are inherent differences in ingredient quality between different 
different countries and places and some of that's geography so you know if you're in I don't know, Scandinavia then you can get some great longestines and scallops mm. but try getting a really good tomato you yeah. know probably not because they just don't have the physical climate to there's not enough sunshine <laughs> you know to to have a sort of fantastic tomato of the kind of tomato you get on the Amalfi coast mm. it's, just, it's just not physically possible um, and Japan's got kind of quite an unusual geography and has just every, everything from you know, the, the, the really cold northern bits of Hokkaido through to subtropical Okinawa and everything in between. Um, but I think not just the geography, but the, there is a sort of whole, um, whether it's a very deep food culture, um, um, but there is an enormously um, rich kind of supply chain mm. um, where there are enough people prepared to spend a lot of money on food um, that they will be quite happy for farmers and and, and you know other suppliers to um, to go to great lengths to produce the absolute finest quality and whether that's in in beef so you know the famous sort of wagyu mm-hmm. beef which you know, Wagyu literally means Japanese beef, you know, by the way. So if you ever hear about, you know, Canadian Wagyu beef, it doesn't really make much sense because Wagyu means, in Japanese, <laughs> means Japanese beef. Um, but in terms of whether well, it's the, 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 the Wagyu beef from someone like, you know, Matsusaka, which is probably the best um, Japanese beef, less famous than Kobe, than Kobe but it's more expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I would say, if you go through and look at the quality of the vegetables and fruit there, um, I've never had better um, fruit and vegetables any, anywhere in the world than, than Japan. Um, so, um, and clearly the seafood there is exceptional. Um, mm. And it's, it's, it's not necessarily what's sort of better fish, but it's just, just the sheer sort of, um, sort of scale of the supply chain means you yeah. can get consistent excellence. So if you go to the market there, it used to be called Skidgy, but it's moved now and it's got a different name. Um, but in Tokyo, then the 65,000 people work at that fish market. 65,000 wow. work there, right? So you know, it's basically a town. That's a huge <laughs> scale. Of its own. Yeah. You know, compare that to Billingsgate or something. I, mean, I don't know any people who work at Billingsgate. But it, it, it's, it's not, not sexy, that, no. <laughs> and 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 so you know, if you are a sort of high-end sushi restaurant, you can get like day in, day out, you know, magnificent uh, sort mm-hmm. of specimens. And so uh, it's a <clears throat> it's a country that's just just blessed with you know whether it's you know partly geography, partly the food culture, partly you know whatever other factors um, that 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 you know you just do if you're a chef, then you, you're sort of starting from a uh, from an advantage. And I remember you know, chatting last year, in fact, to an Italian chef called Luca Fantin, uh, who's in Tokyo now. And um, I mean, he obviously is Italian. Italians famous for their, you know, pride of their mm. ingredients. They get great, you know, vegetables in particular, you know, in, in Italy, which they do. Um, but but he said, you know, it's just like it's like a kid in a candy store being in Tokyo for him because even coming from Italy, um, he says, you know, we can't get ingredients like this. In Italy, wow. you know, and and that's from a, that's, that's from, a, a lot. from an Italian, you know, yeah. it's a it's a lot. So so I think Japanese you know, chefs do have a sort of you know, uh, an inbuilt advantage, if you like, so in, the, in that availability uh, of, of for, stunning projects. For an Italian chef to say that that's something, isn't it? Yeah. So when you're not eating all this lovely three star food, what's your mm. go to food? Um, I really like Indian food actually. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I like all kinds of different food, but I am very fond of Indian food, and I've been to India I don't know, twenty-two times, I think, so far. Oh. And um, I um, enjoy. I had a, a very full. Well, I, I must admit, last night a particularly fine, and in this case, wasn't a, a one Michelin star uh, Indian meal. But but uh, I I say regularly go to uh, less grand um, Indian restaurants, and um, sort of spend a lot of time in, in Southall, uh, which is an area of West London. That uh, you know, has a very high um, Asian population, and um, it's um, yeah, just the sort of that's the kind of food I, I kind of go. So you don't to. review that place though. You just yeah, that, no, oh, no, no, I do. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. No, yeah. I, I've been there. I, 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 I've totally lost count of the number of times oh, I've been really? there, but certainly more than a hundred times. Oh wow, wow, amazing! And um, mm. what is your favourite UK restaurant? So I think the. Um, Maybe a couple of answers. I think in terms of a sort of um, best and a favourite, I think the um, I'm become very fond of uh, of the Ritz in the last few years. I think the John Williams cooking has, has really 
sort of really improve the standard there over the last say sort of decade you know, and so every year it gets better better and better and better and although Michelin still seem to think it's only worth one star I, I, I don't um, and I've certainly I think right now <clears throat> you know that's probably as good a, a meal as you can get in mm. a high-end restaurant in, in London um, it's certainly better than at Alan Ducasse at Dorster which is three stars which you shouldn't have in my view and it's at least comparable to Gordon Ramsay which has three stars and you can even debate whether that's a, a, a good score um, so certainly I think the Ritz is, is, is pretty impressive um, it says a favourite I'm very fond of a little place um, west of London called the Crown at Birchett's Green um, which is a very unusual place it's a little sort of you know, fairly un- unprepossessing sort of pub near, near Maidenhead um, it's got a, a chef um, who um, actually a guy called Simon Bonwick who cooks um, entirely on his own in mm-hmm. the kitchen so they serve about 20 diners <clears throat> there um, and his, one of his sons does the front of house um, well what's very unusual is that despite having no help so no commie chef no sous chef no not even a kitchen porter um, he does very fancy French classical cuisine so you know there's sort of sauces that take you know three days to make um, so he's, he's not knocking out fish and chips here. Mm. You know, this is very elaborate, um, high-end, sort of high-class cooking. Um, and I, I just find the place very, very charming. You know, I think the food's absolutely excellent. Um, uh, the, 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 it's, very, it's a very welcoming place. You know, the hospitality there, the level there is great. And, and it's the kind of food I, I enjoy. I, I, like, I like classical food. Um, so... You know, for me as a sort of favourite, <laughs> you know, that that certainly would be uh, pretty, pretty mine. I did meet Simon last week, and I think I told you earlier, he's a very interesting guy, um, very passionate. Um, his kitchen, you look at it and you think, wow. Like it's, but it's got to be small because it's just him in there. Mm. Um, but ultra focused, very interesting guy. I loved this story. And, um, yeah, but that was a heads up from you because I didn't mm. even know who he was, so... Yeah, thanks for that. And then, what would you say is your favourite restaurant worldwide? Like, um, yeah, favourite. Um, again, favourite and best may be different, but um, it's sort of favourite and certainly extremely impressive um, is um, the it's restaurant. It's a slightly tricky name, but um, Pre des Eugenies, um, uh, which is Michel Gerard's restaurant in the southwest of France. <clears throat> so it's a right in tucked away in the southwest corner in the, in the Lond. Um, and that's so they had three stars for like 42 years now and Michel Gerard is now 86 years old and is still cooking and is still very very spry and active and is at every at pretty much every service um, wow. so it's um, <clears throat> yeah I think it's incredibly it's a very beautiful spot I mean you can stay there it's a, there's a spa there um, and um, they have a, an amazingly good sort of casual restaurant as well there called Ferma Grieve which uh, they've kind of deliberately <clears throat> sort of kept away from Michelin essentially and asked them not to inspect it um, but it's it's actually a fantastic restaurant in its own right and it's remarkable value um, and I like that restaurant actually almost as much as the the, 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 the three star one. Um, so that's a, a really delightful place. It's a very you know, pretty little tiny village and a very very attractive place to stay. And uh, yeah, you eat uh, amazing food. And it's a part of the world that's got a lot of very very fine produce. So so would would you say that because um, France is very well known for its Michelin star restaurants, would you say that the food is better over there than England, or would you just say it's just different? Um, there are clearly a lot more three stars, um, yeah. and and rightly so, you know, to be honest. Um, so there are there is a a a, a group of <clears throat> of those three stars. And I don't think necessarily all of them should have three star, but there's a a group of let's say you know eight or nine or ten or something, which are pretty much world class. So you can put in Michel Garrard, you can put in Troagro. <clears throat> um, you know, you can you know keep sort of um, Troagro is 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 a near. Um, not too far from Lyon in a, in a place called Ouche now it used to be in, in Rouen um, and uh, but these restaurants I mean if you go there I mean you, you're going to get a world class meal there's just, there's, just, there's just no debate about that and there's absolutely nowhere in the UK that's capable of producing a meal of that standard they just, wow. they just aren't you know and if you if you don't believe me then try it yourself yeah. and go and eat it you know you know, and it's not naming names, but you know, go and eat any of the other you know, ones that have three stars at the moment in the UK, and then you go and eat at Dry Grove, let's say, you know, and you'll see the difference, and it's quite apparent. Oh, wow. Well, on that note, I think we'll finish it there.
I think, uh, you know, Andy, I'd like to say thank you for your time, I, you know, and uh, yeah, it's been great. It's been eye opening mm-hmm. and, uh, well, ear opening. And <laughs> well, no, thank you very much for uh, asking me on. Yeah, so and, and what I'd say to anybody listening is that uh, look at your books on Amazon because they're interesting books and. Uh, and hopefully they buy them but I think one is out of print now isn't it yeah, yeah I mean, I mean so. yeah I've, I've done bits of <clears throat> um, um, parts of other other books but I mean yes uh, mainly uh, if you go to andyheller.com yeah uh, and sort of read my, my stuff I say I do all kinds of you know freelance writing so you can google the various Fantastic. places I, 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 I write for but uh, mm. yeah. well Andy thank you very much for your time and we'll get this wrapped up thank you thank you Hey everyone, thank you for listening to episode 20. I hope you all found that as interesting as I did. Andy was a super interesting chap. His very knowledgeable about restaurants, food, the Michelin Guide. I'm surprised he remembers as much as he does about his visits. Be sure to visit his website, www.andyhaler.com to read some of the many reviews he's written. You can also follow Andy Haler on Instagram and Twitter and I've added those links to the show notes. Have a great day.